Hey everyone, it's Mr. Matthew here for our heredity video number one, in which we're going to talk about inheritance and variation of traits. Uh, we're going to specifically focus in on what the model of DNA is, how that model of DNA is related to chromosomes, and then how chromosomes get divided in the formation of gametes through meiosis, and then how gametes will fuse to lead to the formation of a zygote and lead to that next generation in sexual reproduction. So here we go. All right, let's start with the model of DNA. And so in this particular case, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the model was developed. And so in the lower left-hand corner, we can actually see this aluminum cutout that has an A on it. And this aluminum cutout actually is what was used when Watson and Crick built their first three-dimensional model of a double helix. They went to a metal shop and had aluminum models cut of the various parts of DNA. So what is DNA made of? It's made up of a sugar, which is deoxyribose, a phosphate group, and a base. Those three components together are used to form a nucleotide. And so Watson and Crick got a whole bunch of nucleotides cut out of aluminum. And then when they pieced it together, they were actually able to create a model that showed the four different bases and how those bases could possibly go together. The four bases are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And so what we'll see here is that when we put these together, we will see that the adenine and the thymine pair together and the cytosine and guanine pair together. A lot of times these will just be abbreviated with their letters, A's, T's, G's, and C's. Um, and the important thing is that if I look at one of these strands here and I look at the sequence of bases, the letter order of those bases, Looking over here at the left side, I have adenine followed by cytosine, followed by thymine, followed by guanine. That sequence of bases creates a code, and cells can use that code for making proteins. Now, we won't go into the specific process of making proteins uh, right now, but this will come up later, and it is ultimately the sequence of bases that is key in order to make proteins or to provide cells with the instructions for making those proteins. Right, so this image shows me all the way from our strand of nucleotides down at the bottom, which is where our DNA is, all the way up into the form of chromosomes and cells. So let's walk in through this hierarchy uh, from our simple DNA all the way up to the chromosome structure. So when we take those A's, T's, C's, and G's, you'll see here is our familiar double helix and a segment of this DNA is known as a gene. And so if I was to take that segment of DNA and take the bases, the A's, T's, C's, and G's, I can get the sequence that will lead to the formation of a given protein. Now, when that DNA is packed into cells, the way that it's packed is it's wrapped around proteins uh, called histones, and then those histones um, will wind themselves up to form what is known as chromatin. Now, chromatin is that um, mostly what we see when we see a cell and we look inside a cell that is in the middle of interphase of cell cycle, we will see this granular material, which is DNA wrapped around proteins. That wrapping allows us to condense it into a small space like a nucleus because we'll have in our cells up to three billion bases organized into those really, really tight spaces. Now during division, we'll actually get visible structures known as chromosomes. So if we wrap up the chromatin into tight uh, coils and loops, we will actually form visible chromosomes. In human cells, we will actually see 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes, and they will only actually be visible during a cell division process, either through mitosis or meiosis. We don't normally see these X-like structures inside our cells, but during division, they will become visible as they get organized for division and they wind up and form these shapes. So let's look at one of those divisions, and this is the division known as meiosis. So when we look at this particular case, you can see over the far left, there are four chromosomes in this cell. There are two blues and two reds. And this, we can assume, means that each color that we have came from one of the two parents of this individual. So the two blues may have come from dad, and the two reds came from mom. And what this means is that the traits that are being expressed by this individual are based off of the genotypes that are found 
on these specific chromosomes. And so if we were to go back to our letters that lead to genotype and phenotype, what I might find is that over here on this chromosome, we see on this blue chromosome, we have a big A that came from dad, and over on this red, I have a little A that came from mom. The genotype of this individual is big A, little a. Um, their phenotype is gonna be whatever this gene for the letter A codes for, likely will be expressed because I've got a big A, little a genotype, which means we're most likely going to show a dominant trait. Now, when I go to shuffle these up, I am going to end up being able to form a variety of different types of offspring as a result of this when I go through the process of meiosis. Now, meiosis is the process of cell division, which takes my four chromosomes and cuts the number in half through what's known as a reduction division to form gametes. Now, what's a gamete? A gamete is a sex cell, sperm or egg. And it's important that in this process, we go from four chromosomes down to two chromosomes in the gamete, because when the gametes fuse with the, another gamete, when a sperm fuses with egg, we want the next generation to have the same number of chromosomes in its adult form. If we didn't reduce the number of chromosomes, we'd actually have chromosome doubling each generation. And you can imagine that that might eventually cause some issues because there's got to be a limitation to how many chromosomes you can fit in a given nuclei. Now, one of the things you'll notice in this process is that when we move from the interphase into meiosis one, we actually see some portions of chromosome get exchanged. That is known as synapsis or crossing over. And the reason this is important is that this is gonna be one of the factors that increases genetic diversity within these chromosomes. So when this parent goes to pass on genes to its offspring, not only will it have the ability to pass on a gene, the genes it received from dad and the genes it received from mom and can shuffle those in a variety of ways such that one chromosome that it received from dad and one chromosome from mom may end up in each of the cells, or maybe not, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but we'll also form new chromosomal mixes that are mixes of the parents based off the fact that little portions are going to exchange through this process of synapsis. Now, the last little bit I would talk about is we may or may not get one chromosome for mom and one chromosome for dad, or most of one chromosome for mom and one chromosome from dad through this process, or depending on how these align, as you can see here, without the crossing over, we actually would have ended up with identical uh, gametes in a few instances. Now, when you add all this up, the combination of the crossing over and the assortment to get these daughter cells, it's extraordinarily rare that you would get exactly the same gametes formed multiple times. And in our case, we have 46 chromosomes that are doing this lining up, going down to 23 in the gametes. It's highly unlikely that you would get two uh, sperm cells, for example, that would be identical, or two eggs that would be identical from a given parent, just based off of the amount of shuffling that goes in to making each gamete. All right, so the last concept we're going to talk about here is this idea of using sexual reproduction to create new combinations of individuals. So over here on the top, we have the gamete from mom and the gamete from dad up on the top. They fuse together and form the zygote. So you'll see four chromosomes in each of the two gametes, eight chromosomes in the zygote. And so now when that zygote grows up and it goes to make its gametes, you'll see that all of these radiating out forms that we see here, these represent different possible ways that this individual could shuffle its genes to produce gametes. And the point being here is that we have enormous diversity with only four chromosomes and this doesn't even show any possibility of having crossing over. Again, we have 46 chromosomes, so you can envision how many different possibilities. It turns out that it's billions of possibilities when you go up to the number of chromosomes we have, as opposed to, you know, just 16 different variations without crossing over here. Again, the point being that this process of sexual reproduction, both in the formation of the gametes through meiosis and through the process of fertilization, is going to lead to enormous genetic diversity in the next generation as we do all the shuffling of genes. All right, so that sums it all up for us. Uh, you should have a good handle on current model of DNA, how that was first built and how it actually connects uh, DNA to the structure of chromosomes. And then a little bit on how chromosomes um, are shuffled up and sorted during meiosis and then furthermore how they come together in fertilization.
you should also be able to tie these models back to the concepts of genotypes and phenotypes, phenotypes being the physical characteristics and genotypes being the genes. And you should also notice that you will not see any questions on the MCAS that ask you to identify specific phases of meiosis, even though there are several specific name phases or any of the biochemical um, mechanisms involved with the process of meiosis or the regulation of meiosis. Uh, you should just know that meiosis is going to be used to shuffle up those genes to form those gametes. All right, I hope that was helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.